Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Information Security Club for the academic year of 2021 to 2022. Um, my name is Alex. I am the president of the Information Security Club, and and I am Joshua. I am the vice president of the Information Security Club. Uh, so it's been a long time since I've talked to my computer screen alone in my room. So <laughs> you'll have to be a little uh, patient with me as I get used to holding these workshops. But I'm going to share my screen right now, and we're just going to go through a little intro, welcome, explain what we're doing for the rest of the year, etc. Um, so first things first, uh, attendance. Uh, so I'll go a little bit more on attendance later, but we like to know who comes to our workshops um, for membership reasons largely. So I would like everyone to assign attendance. You can either scan the QR code that is right on the screen or you can follow the link. I've also posted the link in the chat. So if you want to follow it there, you can. Um, please make sure that you fill it out. You can put zero if you're not a U of C for UCID, if you're not a U of C student. Uh, you don't need to be a UFC student to attend our workshops. Um, that being said, let's do a little housekeeping for the, our first workshop ever. So attendance check, talked about that. Uh, join the Discord. We have another fun QR code for everyone to scan to join our Discord and also a link right here. It is also, the link also exists on our website if you want to go to our website and find it there. That's the Discord's just where everyone talks. It's where we do a lot of our communication as a club. We'll post all of our announcements in the announcements channel of the Discord. We sometimes sit in the chilling voice chat channel and play games and just hang out, uh, do different information security things. The advanced workshops as we go farther into the semester will happen on the Discord. And it's just great to have a community, especially when you might do all of your school from home <laughs> um, and just get connected with other students who are interested in information security like you. So join the Discord. Um, this note, you should have Kali Linux set up on a virtual machine, ideally. Uh, it will be OK today if you don't have that already set up. Uh, you shouldn't quite need it. The only thing you need today is SSH. But if you have it, if you want to attend our next workshop, you will want to have a virtual machine with Cali set up in order to follow along the, with the workshops. Um, find us online. We do have a website that we're quite proud of at infosecucalgary.ca. It has our calendar for the year. It talks about our speakers and just has a lot of information about us. It also has our last year's Make by CTF winners, stuff like that. Um, we're also Infosec U Calgary on social, all social media. So we have Instagram, we have Facebook, and we have Twitter. Follow us there for fun posts, possibly featuring execs, little bios about execs. And also you'll just get warnings about our upcoming workshops. Uh, follow us on everything. <laughs> awesome. And now uh, next up, I'd like to give an introduction to all the members of our executive team patiently waiting over on a Discord call right now. There they are. Uh, so the ones you've already met are Alex Tenney, our president, and myself, Joshua, uh, just Josh, and the VP. So from top left going across, let's say, uh, we have Emna, our secretary. We have Braden, one of our VP techs. Uh, Dolores screen isn't showing up at the moment, but she is one of our directors. And then we have Ejaz, our VP of operations. We have Ethan, who is another one of our directors, as well as Greg, a director. Uh, we have Brandon over here, another one of our VP techs. Jeremy wearing some goggles of some sort. Uh, he is one of our directors as well for this year. Uh, Justin over here uh, is our VP of communications. The person in the Pikachu outfit is Raymond. He is another of our directors, and he's having a great time over there. <laughs> then there's other Josh, who is one of our VP techs. Uh, Dan, who just recently joined us as a junior executive. Uh, and then we have Sonny over here on the bottom left. He is our VP of finance. Then we have Zach, who is one, another one of our directors. And the last two pictures are Alex and I, but we're over here. Everyone wave hello. Yeah. <laughs> it's slightly delayed on your guys' end, so you'll watch them all slowly <laughs> wave. <laughs> uh, as well, there is one more who isn't here. That's Pratham, another of our directors. Uh, perfect. And on the topic of junior execs, we are actually looking for some more junior execs to join us for the upcoming year. If you're interested in what the club does and like to take part in all that we do, this is the perfect opportunity. 
especially many of our execs graduating this year to ensure that we can keep offering the workshops, the CTF, which you'll find out more about later, and everything else, need more people to keep us going and make it even better. Uh, so being an exec in the club does come with its perks, such as networking with industry professionals, taking part in some competitions and events that we are invited to, as well as building up a lot of different projects you can show off to uh, when you're applying for jobs. Uh, with that, though, especially with the projects, comes a lot of work. Uh, don't want to lure you in and blindside you with all the work if you do choose to apply and join us. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you're interested. And if you are, uh, then please do come for the information session. We'll be hosting that Wednesday, September 29th. That's next week at 6 p.m. over on our Discord. Uh, any student is able to apply, and we especially encourage any first years who are interested to check it out. As for how to apply to be a junior, it will be... Uh, there will be an application form given out at the information session and it'll be posted on our Discord at the same time. Yeah. If you absolutely cannot make the information session, please DM Josh on Discord. Um, he, we have our names on our Discord when, under the execs and just let him know and we will probably make accommodate. We will definitely make accommodations for you. Yep. Um, I can give you the whole spiel if you want. Yeah. <laughs> on notes of junior execs, if you're at all interested in joining our club as an executive and just helping us allow this club to run but you're a little nervous because we're on our first workshop and you haven't done any information security yet uh do not fear we know <laughs> that is the point of being a junior so if you're at all interested in joining please come to the information session don't let any type of experience or anything sway you away from joining um membership so we have in order to be a member of our club, we have two rules. Uh, basically, first is that you have to pay our membership fee, which is $10. That fee can be sent to an e-transfer to infosec.ucalgary at gmail.com. We have a couple rules. We want to know your Discord identifier just so we can give you um, the role on Discord. That's the main one. But we'd also like your name, your first name and your last name, and possibly your student ID in the message that you e-transfer us to. Uh, information about this is on our website and you can always get us to clarify. It can take us about 24 hours to process any uh, e-transfers and give you that full status on Discord, but we will process it as quickly as we can, remembering that we are all students as well and we have tons of classes that we need to get to in school. Uh, the second condition to being a full member is that you have to attend at least half of our workshops. So I made you take attendance at the beginning of this session, and that is because we need to know who has attended at least half of our workshops at any given time. Mem full members are given voting rights at our AGM at the end of the year. This allows you to vote for your new executives each year, um, vote on constitution, amendments, things like that. Uh, on the constitution, because we're an SU, um, registered club, we have to have a constitution. You can find it in club documents in our Discord. It's a text channel that you guys shouldn't be able to write to, hopefully, but you can read. Uh, you read it if you want. It talks all about how our AGMs work. It talks a lot about the different roles of our different executives and just how our club runs. Uh, it's a lot of bureaucracy stuff, but I think it's important. I'm in poli sci. I think it's important. So read it if you want. Um, it's open for everyone to see. Um, I talked a little bit about elections, but at the end of the year, we do elect our actual executives. So directors are unelected, but executives are. Um, we will run our elections during that time. You need to be a full member in order to vote, and we are currently running them online. Um, someone asked, is there anything you get for being a full member other than being able to vote? Can you still attend workshops if you aren't a full member? Um, you can attend all of our workshops. Uh, something about being premium members, the people who pay $10 as well, they will get access to something we will talk about called the Speaker Series. This is a special event that we hold on some of our workshop days. Only premium members, those who have paid the club fee, are allowed to go to that. And they will also get early access to signing up for Magpie CTF, along with some other possible perks. But everyone can attend our actual workshops. Um, that is for everyone. We wanted to keep this as accessible as possible while still being able to give some perks to those who pay so everyone can attend the normal workshops. As well, you don't have to run for election to uh, get a junior exec position. Uh, you apply and then uh, we review your application and take you in as a junior exec if everything's all right. 
Uh, and now on to the code of ethics. So our club teaches skills related to exploring vulnerabilities in systems. So with that comes responsibility to be ethical in what we do and to never act maliciously. So we ask that all of our members commit to being ethical hackers and to take the skills that we teach and please not use them for the forces of evil. Uh, for this, we have drafted a code of ethics defining the general rules around what you can and cannot do. Basically, be a decent human, be excellent to each other, and it's nothing too crazy. Uh, if you're ever at a crossroads, not sure if you should be doing something, please reach out to one of the execs and ask us. Uh, we take this responsibility seriously, and anyone found in violation of our code of ethics will be kicked out of the club. Uh, you can find a copy of this document in the Discord channel under Club Documents, and we ask that everyone please uh, give it a read and sign it. We'll probably be asking for it at a later meeting. Yeah. Um, just so you know, you don't have to email us your code of ethics or anything. We will eventually, in our attendance, ask for it. We want people to sign it to be able to do our workshops and just keep us safe and allow us to not teach you anything that you're going to use maliciously. But we'll ask for it within our attendance form that you've signed today in a different workshop. So just be ready for that. Um, but we'll probably give you some warning before the workshop. Um, club culture. So luckily, I am still actually one of the founders of this club. I started the club. And when we started the club, something we really wanted is we wanted to create a club which promoted an environment where people felt safe and comfortable to learn. Um, a big part of that is knowing nothing is good. Uh, a lot of you are coming in, you've never done any information security, you're maybe very new to computer science and didn't do a lot of programming or aren't very comfortable with computers before. That's how I started off. Um, and you have to know nothing to eventually be someone who knows, uh, who is an expert about something someday. You have to start as a beginner. That's how it works. So don't be afraid that when we say words that you don't know anything about, don't be afraid to ask uh, questions throughout the workshops. The point of this club is for you guys to learn and feel safe in doing that. Um, on that note, if you are someone who already knows tons and tons about information security, it's your passion, you've been doing it since you were very small, there are tons of people out there like that, uh, then help people. We want to promote a society that is um, privacy aware and information security aware, and that can't happen if we're like hoarding information to ourselves and just, <laughs> we need to help each other. So if someone is lost on our challenge, um, offer to help them. If someone wants to learn how to set up a Kali VM and you have that information, help them. Uh, if you learn something super cool and want to tell the execs, we'll always listen. We're still learning ourselves. We're always learning new techniques. We're trying to read as much news as possible. Just help people and share your knowledge. Um, on that note, don't assume others know what you know. Uh, I knew very little. I was very tech illiterate coming into computer science, and that meant I knew very little about computers in general, some things that people take for granted. So really think about the words that you're saying, and is that common knowledge, essentially? And if it's usually anything technical, it's not common knowledge. <laughs> That's just a rule. Um, finally, just because we do want to promote learning. I think trying something first, messing around with it until you really get stuck, then getting help is the best way to learn. It's important to fail to learn, failing upwards, as they say. Uh, so before you immediately ask for help for someone to do a walkthrough on a challenge, on a CTF, on a box, really try and put your best effort towards solving the challenge by yourself and then maybe go ask for help go look up a walkthrough go do something else that will help you get in the right direction so then the question is what do we actually do yeah so how do you actually get to learn the things that we were talking about uh we mainly do it through our workshops it's the thing that got us started and it's the main focus of our club uh, so these are two-hour sessions every Monday from 6 to 8 p.m., in which uh, one of our execs will teach and provide a hands-on learning about some topic related to InfoSec. Uh, so for the past year and a bit, we've operated online, streaming the workshops over YouTube and Twitch, and this will be continuing for the upcoming year, too, because it's a little tough to get everyone in the same room. Uh, so for this year, uh, as well, we'll be running two workshops in parallel every week, over the fall semester at least. One will be for beginner members and the other for more experienced members. Uh, and But then once the winter semester hits, we'll be switching over to one advanced workshop per week. And if you're new to the club right now, the beginner workshops that we're gonna be offering over fall, uh, they'll be exactly what we need to get into those advanced ones later on.
uh, as well for the fall semester, the advanced workshops will instead be streamed over on our Discord so that the YouTube and Twitch are reserved for the beginner workshops. Uh, as well, something about our workshops, we don't want them to be lectures ever. We don't think anyone needs more of those in their lives. So we always try to ensure that our workshops are balanced between teaching you the concepts and letting you apply what we've been taught through some challenges that we give you. Uh, just as our club culture says, always all right to ask questions if you're feeling lost or confused or just need some clarification. Point of these are for you to learn and specifically to learn by doing. So we're always happy to provide help if you need it and answer any of your questions as best we can. Uh, as well, if you'd like to see in advance what we'll be doing for our workshops, they're all listed on our website underneath the calendar. And that's infosecucalgary.ca. Um, so the speaker series, I kind of alluded to this already. Uh, this is for our paying members who pay that $10 fee at the beginning. We have five speaker series. I don't 100% remember the date, but we have two in the fall and three in the winter. They're spaced out pretty evenly. Um, and what we do with the speaker series is we essentially get um, industry professionals, academics and in information security, people who work in the different fields of information security that might know a little more about a very specific topic that our execs might not know anything about. Um, so right now, our, we have three confirmed. We have Chris Shepard. He is going to do a presentation on open source intelligence. If you competed in Magpie CTF last year, you know that we had a couple open source intelligence uh, challenges last year. This is basically going on the internet and finding out things that is just readily available. So parsing through documents, doing archival research, finding people on social media, things like that. Uh, he just said in the fall, our dates are on October 18th. That's when Chris Shepping and presenting. And November 15th, Ruth Promislau um, is a cyber law uh, academic and she's going to be presenting something on cyber law. We're still working out the details with her. Then in the winter, we have Dr. Jason Jas Kolka, he's recently um, said yes to our speaker series and he's doing cybersecurity in multi-agent systems. So this is a little bit of machine learning if you aren't familiar with what multi-agent systems are. But if you're interested in AI, it's something that you would probably very, be very interested in. We're still working out our last two speakers. Uh, we'll keep you guys updated and we'll update our website as we get those confirmed. Um, reminder that this is for premium members. Awesome. And so uh, if you were here last year, you'll remember our previous big event, Magpie CTF 80s. Uh, so we're, it's returning for a second iteration, but this time we're going to be doing a heist edition. The whole thing will be themed around a fictional heist that the competitors are carrying out. Uh, it'll take place over the second semester, so the second weekend of the winter semester reading week. That's February 25th to 27th. And there'll be cash prizes for the winners as well as swag and giveaways. I will be having more details about the CTF, like what the storyline is and the registration uh, coming out over the course of the semester. Uh, so just keep an eye out on the Discord. Uh, and as well as mentioned previously, premium members will be getting early access to registration. A uh, friendly reminder that last year's uh, winners were U of C students. Uh, so you can totally win this and win some money um, and get something to put on your resume. Uh, going to our workshops definitely helps. We definitely cater our workshops towards things that we put inside our CTFs. So I recommend coming to your workshops if you want to prepare for this. Especially the beginner ones. The beginner ones are uh, a great introduction to a bunch of uh, CTF challenges. And you'll probably see some, a few of them in our CTF as well. Uh, if I've just been throwing around a random acronym and you have no idea what a CTF is, I'm sorry. Uh, but we'll go into that now. Uh, so a CTF uh, is, stands for Capture the Flag. And it's kind of a hacking competition. Uh, so in these team, it's a team-based competition. So teams compete. They use techniques related to uh, various categories related to infosec, like uh, as you see on the screen here, web exploitation and cryptography. Uh, they'll use these to solve challenges, which earns them points. And as you might expect, the team with the most points wins. Uh, so there are a few different styles of CTF, such as attack and defense. But the ones we typically do, and the style that our very own CTF will be, is called Jeopardy style, uh, which we have example of on the next slide. Cool. Uh, so Jeopardy slide. Uh, so this is what C Jeopardy style CTFs generally look like. You'll see a bunch of different cards with words and numbers on them divided into different sections. So each card represents a challenge with the numbers being the amount of points each is worth. 
generally, the higher the points, the harder the challenge. Uh, the challenges also come with descriptions, hints, whatever files you might need to solve them. And they can range from very easy to extremely challenging. Uh, so if you are interested in CTFs and starting them out, uh, a, great way is, a great way to get into them is to attend their workshops. From those, you can get some of the basic skills you need to start some of the easier challenges. And then as well, the most important thing is to practice. So just practice and work your way up from those very easy challenges to the extremely challenging ones that uh, all of our executive team struggles with. Uh, as well, the way that you know when a challenge is solved is, some, is you obtain something that's called a flag, uh, which, should, yeah. Uh, so flags are something you're gonna see throughout the semester and throughout the entire school year as well if you continue attending these workshops. Uh, flag is basically just a string of characters, so numbers, letters, everything in between, and it's in a specific format similar to what you see on the screen. Uh, usually a few characters and some curly brackets with some text inside. Uh, so in the CTF, these are what you will submit to prove that you solved the challenge or receive points. Uh, our club will also be giving out flags throughout the semester, though, uh, through challenges in our workshops, which you'll be seeing later on in this one, actually, through the newsletter and wherever else we can fit them. If you find any of these, uh, you can submit them to the ORCID bot on our Discord, uh, and that is just in the ORCID section right there, the channel. And that's what nope. I think the main draw of the club. Do no. not submit it through our ah, right, Discord. Right, right, right. Make submit sure that you DM Orchid with yeah. your flag or else you are giving the flag away to everyone else. Um, right. We've tried to make it, but make sure that you DM the bot Orchid specifically. <laughs> I've made that mistake before. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> main draw of the club, what I think is the fake internet points. So we keep track of all the flags you submit, all the points you earn by DMing Orchid. And you can view the leaderboard through the ORCID channel on the Discord. Uh, so you can type in, I have it there, O leaderboard. And yeah, if we can show that. So you can see uh, what the points are, who's in the top 10, uh, and then where you stand as well. So if you are in the top 10 of this leaderboard by the end of the winter semester, you'll also be honored with a special role in the Discord, uh, which is there as well. So top 10s from 2020 to 2021. And uh, yeah, it's a great thing to have. As well, for the flags in our club, they tend to be of the format UC sec with some curly brackets around some other text. So keep an eye out for anything that might look like that. And if you see it, uh, submit it to ORCID via the DM. As well, if you are interested in CTFs participating in a few, keep an eye out on the Discord. Uh, some of our execs will share which one ones we're working on or once they catch our eye. Uh, but and on to King of the Hill. Um, so King of the Hill is a little new to our club. Uh, we did it. We ran a couple rounds of King of the Hill last year, but it was never something we did a lot of over the summer. A lot of execs were working really hard to get good at breaking boxes and penetration testing. And so we did a lot of King of the Hill. When I'm saying King of the Hill, what do I mean? It's a competitive hacking game where you're trying to break into a machine. So a computer. Um, gain access to some user on that server or that on that machine, escalate those privileges to become the administrator of the machine, and then write your name to a file inside the root fo folder. Once you've done those steps, you now have to patch and defend the vulnerabilities that allowed you to get inside the, t the machine to make sure that no one else can take your place as king, who is the person that's written their name in the file. Um, Along the way, there will be flags hidden inside the machine, which give you points. You also get points for every minute that your name is written to that king file. Uh, whoever has the most points at the end of the hour wins. And it's a super fun attack defense game if you're into penetration testing and into defending. Um, we're going to actually be playing it today if you are already familiar with the Linux terminal and you feel you can jump straight to King of the Hill. Great. We're going to have some execs in the Discord that will play with you. Uh, maybe teach you how to connect to the machine if you feel comfortable with the Linux terminal, but you don't feel comfortable with King of the Hill, they'll be able to sit in and maybe walk you through how to connect and maybe show you a few tips and tricks. Uh, if I just said a bunch of words that don't mean anything to any of you guys, fear not. You probably need to go to the Linux terminal or workshop and you will understand a little bit more about what King of the Hill is actually asking from you and you will understand over time. So this is a final link for those of you 
who haven't filled out attendance yet. Again, we need our members to fill out attendance. It just helps us know who actually has voting rights at the end of the year. And it also helps us figure out what workshops went well and which ones didn't and just our overall participation in the end. So make sure that you fill out the attendance. Um, it's really important. Um, and we are now going to split off. So those of you who feel comfortable with the Linux terminal, you can go into, I believe there are people in the chilling chat we will use um, to play King of the Hill. And then everyone else can stay as we start doing our Linux basics. The form for attendance is no longer accepting responses. Um, can someone on the executive team check that? Um, we will try and get that figured out. Uh, we will count your guys' attendance and we will figure that out. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, yep, everyone can log their attendance. It helps us no matter what. Um, you might decide to pay the fee later. It might be more helpful. But everyone, please do your attendance. Um, and finally, for the Linux workshop, not having Linux doesn't matter, hopefully. <laughs> um, because me and Josh have set up a machine for you guys to attack from your own computers. And we'll teach you how to connect to it as well. So not completely lost. Okay. Getting started. So this is the command that you guys need to run um, for to get into the workshop. I'm going to type it out in the chat. Um, that was Brandon. You can ignore him. Um, I think he's a Linux snob. <laughs> um, I'm typing this command in the chat, but we will talk about what it actually does. So we are going to do something called SSH. What is SSH? If you don't have SSH installed, I think Windows and Mac have it pre-installed, which are the most common distributions. I posted links in the announcements page of our Discord on documentation on how to install it, you can always DM one of our execs or post a question in here and we will get someone to help figure that out if for some reason your computer has missed the boat or deleted the package or something. If you're on Linux, you can simply do an apt install SSH client, SSH dash client, and that should install it as well. But what is this magical tool I keep talking about? So SSH stands for secure shell. Josh, continue. I'm sorry, I'm taking your part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as you wish. Uh, so secure shell. Uh, this is do. Uh, so this basically grants you access to the uh, shell that the computer is operating on. Do we have thing? No. Really. Okay, uh, so you're basically connecting to a computer which exists somewhere far away. Uh, like at, it may be like you may be accessing it from home, but the thing is at school. These come up a lot in classes at UFC as well. And this particular machine is just running on a website called DigitalOcean. So they host servers, which are just computers that they are storing. Uh, they have let's see. So to break down this little part here, I'm gonna call myself out right here. <laughs> um, I have not explained at all what we're supposed to do. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to do a walkthrough on my Windows computer. I have Windows. Um, I have familiarity with Mac, so I can probably help people with Mac as well. Um, and I have quite a bit of familiarity with Linux. So I'm going into my start menu on my Windows. Um, you've definitely been here before, and I'm searching um, my different apps. So if you're on a Windows machine, you're going to want to search command prompt. It's this big black box. It just looks like a big black box. And when you open it, 
it will open this application. I'm going to make mine, oh no, Windows. <laughs> I can't make mine bigger. Hopefully that is big enough. All it says is C users Alexa, because that's what I've named my laptop or my user that I'm logged in on. And I want you guys to paste this SSH command inside your terminal. Um, but not yet, because we're going to explain stuff. If you're on a Mac, um, it's called a terminal, T-E-R-M-I-N-A-L. And it's also, I think, called a terminal on Linux. Correct me if I'm wrong. PowerShell will also probably work. Um, PowerShell scares me. <laughs> Not going to lie. But I but, use it. It does work on there as well. Yes, PowerShell yeah. will probably work. If it's not working on your no command prompt, switch to PowerShell. It will probably do a little better um, for reasons. Um, so that is where we're actually going to be running this command. That command prompt, if you think about it in, I don't know, I in the 80s, before computers had UIs and GUIs, yes, it should ask for a password. Um, but in the 80s, before computers had UIs or GUIs, they were just that. So you can kind of understand why people were like, I don't know how to use a computer. Everything is stressful. There were no mice. There was nothing. There was just a keyboard and that awful screen. <laughs> um, and that's why no one knew how to use a computer because it wasn't user friendly. You had to know quite a bit to actually be able to start using that. So inside that computer is actually inside that screen is actually all of your files and everything on your computer. Therefore, you can run all of your programs from it. Um, unless they have a graphical interface, then it will maybe do it. It might mess up. I've never tried to run Chrome from a terminal. <laughs> you probably could. Um, <laughs> Jeremy asks some good questions. What's a UI and what is a GUI? Um, a UI is, it stands for user interface, and a GUI, GUI is a GUI, which I don't remember what the G stands for, graphical. so you caught me there. Graphic. Um, graphical, yeah. <laughs> graphical user interface, but it's basically just the thing that displays on your screen that is not text. The pictures, the place that you click your mouse, um, all of that is considered UI, or the things that you interact with. Um, the terminal doesn't have that. It's just text. Um, it's not user-friendly. It's stressful um, to use. I would not recommend using PuTTY. I don't know what will happen. <laughs> um, PuTTY, I, I don't know. You maybe could. Um, yes. I will talk about why Windows has two later. That's a little bit of a big thing, but let's continue on. We're gonna talk about what this command does and then we're gonna tell you the password to actually get in. Yeah. All right, so secure shell, you're accessing a remote computer uh, from the safety of your own home and remotely JS. And then everything you do on this machine that you're about to access will actually happen on the machine in California as well. Uh, so if you delete a file, that file will no longer exist anywhere just as if you were deleting a file on your own home computer. And then the second part of this command is the magpie. So that is the user that we're going to be logging in as. Uh, so like when you log into a school computer, asks you in to input a username and password. This is the same for all computers, uh, as long as you set that up. So when you log on to your personal computer, you also have to put in the username and password. Uh, so each user that is on the machine can see and edit different files, programs, things on the computer, depending on which user they are. And this will be the same for us. So Magpie, only user I know of on this one, but so it'll be able to see and edit the different files that are on there. Um, after, no, you do not need to create your own domain on it. For this, we've done it all for you. So after this, this is called an IP. Um, IPs stand for internet protocol address. Um, so basically, if you think about your house, your house has an address, and that's how you're able to tell people where you live, um, how they can send mail to you, how they can find you. Everything on the internet, if we're connecting to it from our home, needs to also have that address. So when you go to Google, you go to www.google.com. That is their address. 
underneath that address, there is actually a big number um, that is unique to them that you could also theoretically go to. Um, so this is just an address for the computer that we're trying to remote into or we're trying to pretend our computer is. Um, that's it. IPs have a lot more complicated of why the numbers are the way that they are. Um, someone could probably explain that to you. You could probably Google it, but we're not going to get into that today. Um, and our final part of this command, the fourth part of this command, is this dash p2222. So there's two parts to this. This dash p um, is called a flag because this is a command and commands can sometimes have flags or options. That basically means we're modifying something that is originally default. So SSH actually has, um, the P itself actually stands for port. Um, ports, if you think about parking spots, if you go somewhere often, you might have a reserved parking spot for you. If I go to the UFC often, which I do, I have my own parking spot that is just for me. No one else can park there. Um, it's mine. But also a lot of people go to UFC some of the times. So you might pay for parking that day and then you get a parking stall that's yours for that day, but not for the whole year. Ports are similar. So some ports are reserved to certain services or certain commands. Um, and they are standard. So SSH actually has a standard port of 22. If you run this SSH command without this tash P2222, it will try and go into port 22. Um, through some funkiness of how we've set up this, we're actually using 22 for something else. Um, so we are telling it then that we actually want to go to port 2222. Um, and that is all that it's doing. Uh, if this is a lot right now, it's okay. It ultimately won't matter that much for the workshop. It's just interesting to know. So now I'm giving you guys the password. A lot of you asked you when you ran that command in your terminal, it asks you for a password. Our password is ka ka ka, three cause, like a bird crowing, um, all lowercase, no numbers, no spaces. So that is not what I want. As I showed you guys, this is my command line. Um, it says, my username and users, it will look like that for everyone. And I am going to run the command. I think I have it copied. No, I don't. I have <laughs> the SSH magpie at the IP hack P 2222. And then it asks me for a password. So I am going to run ka ka ka. And look at that. <laughs> um, we are in the other machine. You'll see that it looks a lot like how you opened the command line originally. I'm wondering if I do this. I can't make it bigger, which sucks. Um, hopefully that remains okay. Let me know if it's like impossible to see uh, what I'm actually doing on screen or else it's going to be a very frustrating workshop. So we're now in this machine. This machine is actually now a directory. What is a directory? What is a file system? That's a lot of questions. What do you mean by service stays the same? I believe it's asking a question of another answer in the chat. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Someone said they can't see. I'm going to try something, which is get into my virtual box on Kali because I can make it bigger there. If you've set up your Kali, this might look familiar. through properties. But how do I get to properties? Right click the header up there and properties. Incredible. Cursor and then size, font. font. It 
Is this big enough? I'm going to assume it's a yes. <laughs> Anyways, so we're in some mystical place and we have no idea where we are. We're actually in something called a file system. So you guys are familiar with file systems on your regular computers. Um, on, now you guys get to look at all my files, super fun. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's on here. My file system's a mess, just a heads up. Um, so on, what is it called on Windows? On Windows, it is called File Explorer. And on Mac, it's called File Finder. So you guys are all familiar with this. This is where you go in and you can like double click your programs to open them. You can put all of your notes um, with class and all your different documents and everything. And it's what I called earlier a GUI. So like you can see it and you can click on things. Um, it's easy to use. That same thing actually exists in this command prompt thing I talked about. Um, so if I do a side-by-side -side of my command prompt, which I'm going to make bigger because someone taught me how to do that. And my file finder, you'll see in here, I'm in the C drive, users and Alexa. So if I do the same, I go into my Windows C drive, users and Alexa, I can actually, through fun Windows commands, see all of the same files that I can see here. So basically, I'm able to navigate through my whole computer and do a bunch of stuff there. When we're actually SSH'd into this machine, we're going to be able to see all of the same things. Um, Josh, you may go ahead. Uh, so on this one, so the first thing you can do when you open up this terminal here is you can check where you are. And you can do that by typing in the command pwd. Thank you, Alex, for being my fingers today. Uh, so if you type pwd, it'll show up the, it stands for print working directory, just shows uh, which uh, directory you're currently in. And if you're not sure what directory is, directory is essentially just folder. So it shows the current folder that we're in. And right now we are two away from the root of the file system. So we are, there's two folders before us, home and magpie. And we are currently in magpie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what Josh meant by, oh, now my tally's open, go away. Um, meant by the word root. Um, so you can think of folders, all of these directories are actually just folders on your computer, like they are on your Windows machine or on your Mac machine. And you can think of them as nested. So there's one big Russian nesting doll that holds all the smaller Russian nesting dolls inside of it. The same is true about folders. So in your Windows, you think of your C drive, and inside your C drive are a bunch of other files, usually the Windows stuff, the different program files, and then the documents and settings. I'm gonna focus on the documents and settings. Inside the documents and settings, there is a folder for all users and then your own personal folder. So mine was Alexa. And then it has all of my personal stuff in that I've put inside of it. So different videos, different pictures, documents, programs, whatever is just mine. So we talked about users. Users have some things, some folders that are just accessible to them and they're just theirs. But as we go out farther and farther, the folders get bigger and bigger and there's more and more things inside of them. So the root folder is actually considered the biggest folder. Um, so in Windows, um, I recently learned that this is contested, um, but in Windows, um, I consider the root folder to be the C drive. Um, so this is just another look at it again through a file finder. I tried to find the most simple one as possible because I realized mine isn't very simple. Um, I have a lot of stuff in my computer. So you see the C drive. The C drive has all the users. Then you go down to Martin and then Martin has all of his stuff in it. But that root, that main big, the first folder is the C drive. Um, we're in a Linux machine. I can actually prove that through a command. Um, if I go you, 
you can see we're on something called Alpine Linux. Um, Alpine Linux is something probably no one will use as a real distribution, like day to day on their computer. It's just something very small that's easy for us to host. But we're on um, a Linux machine and Linux is basically like the third possible type of computer you can have. So you can have a Windows computer, you can have um, a Mac, or you can have a Linux machine. So on Linux, the file system looks like this. So root is just denoted by this slash, and it's the big folder that has everything. The same way that um, Windows has the C drive that has everything in it, Linux has the root folder that has everything in it. Um, and then it has a bunch of these files. These are mostly standardized on a Linux machine. I actually have an infographic on my GitHub self plug that explains what is normally in all of these. Um, but the same way that Windows has a users folder, Linux also has a users folder. It would be inside of home. Um, and then inside of home are all of their users. So our path is currently home slash magpie. So our user is magpie. And that makes sense because that's what we've logged in through. Awesome. And now we, so we know where we are in the Linux file system and we know what the Linux file system looks like, but we don't actually know what's inside of here. Uh, so if we want to take a look at that, what we can do is we can type in a command called ls just lists what is currently in this directory. So what we have here is a thing called directory highlighted in blue, an example file.txt and a flag.txt. So directories different directory has a different color because it's a directory. I would try naming that so it was easier on you. Uh, but so this Direc just shows you hmm? directory for everyone who's confused by that word just means folder. So these could all be considered like PyCharm projects. That's a folder, but it could also just be considered a directory, yep. just in case that wording is weird to you. Yes. If you ever hear me say directory, just translate folder, or I'll just say folder. But this is also not all that Ellis is capable of. If we want to find out more about it, we can type in, we can try and access the manual for it. And we do that by doing man space ls. There we go. Uh, so in here is the manual for the command, and it shows all that it's capable of, has a description, as well as the flags that we talked about earlier. So different options you can give the command to have it uh, operate in a different way. So if we scroll down a bit on there. We can. Sorry, I was actually scrolling. <laughs> um, the terminal doesn't know where your mouse is, um, fun reminder. So you can actually scroll like a normal person, you ha have to uh, use your arrow keys to go downwards. <laughs> yeah. Just like the old computers. All right, there we are. So those are the options I was just talking about. Uh, you'll see there's quite a few. Uh, the ones we want to focus on are the first one is TAC A. So that's the dash A. It writes out all the entries in the directory and includes what we call hidden directories, so or hidden files and folders. So those are just folders and files that start that names start with a dot. And we can show that one off. In the... To exit the manual, you press Q. Yes. And it should let you leave. Um, all of the stuff will still be on the screen, but you'll see this little dollar sign means that I can start typing commands again. And if the screen ever gets a little too cluttered for you, you can always press you can always type in clear and it will give a brand new section for you. Yeah, so if we were to type in ls-a here. There we go. Then it will show us all the files in here, and you'll notice that there's more than the, when we just typed in ls. There's pics of mice and super secret picture. Uh, we'll find out a bit more on those later, but those are not meant to be seen because they have the dot in front of them. And then there is one other thing that we can do that will show you with ls. So if you want to find out more information about the files, you can type in ls-l. And that there shows you a lot more information on the files that are not hidden. So from the left on there, you'll see that we have uh, a set of, was that 10 characters? 
So you have a special character called D on the front of it, and then you have three sets of three letters, which are basically just the permissions that different users on the file system have for that file. So the first set of three numbers mean that that is what the owner can do. So it means that the owner can read, write, and execute. Uh, then the second set of three letters is for a certain group in the file system. So groups can be assigned, and they can be assigned different uh, permissions depending on the file. So in this case, the group root can read and execute. And then the same for the last set of three characters. That is for all users on the system. It doesn't matter who. And then you have the, let's see, you have the two roots there. Those are the owner and the group, respectively. And then the numbers that you see over on the side, like 4096, 83, and 149, are the size of the files in bytes, as well as the creation date and time of each file, which might be a bit off unless if one of us was up at 4 a.m. creating this. But... Um, I'm going to take a quick pause and see if anyone is confused, if you have any questions or anything. Like if anything that doesn't make lot. sense, yes. that was a lot. Yeah. Um, and during this pause, because I get to awkwardly sit here in silence because of the lag, I will tell you a story that will hopefully encourage questions. Mm -hmm. um, in my first year, I didn't know anything about tech. I've explained this before. Um, and I missed the first week of class because I was completing an internship at the time and it was my last week. So I missed the first two classes of my computer science class. In those classes, they kind of explained the terminal a little bit to us, but of course I missed it because I wasn't there. Um, and then a friend then navigated me to the folder where all of my Python projects, the language that we were learning at the time, were in so I could run it. I knew how to run a Python program, and that's all I really knew. And so he navigated me there, but I didn't know how he got there, and he never explained it to me, and I just didn't know even really understand what the terminal was, but I knew I could run my projects through it. So my solution to that was I never closed the terminal and I never turned off my laptop for like three months because I didn't know how to navigate back to my projects. And so I managed to not learn the terminal for a really long time in a computer science degree because I was too embarrassed to ask. The point is that no one ever knows how to do this stuff until they learn. So if you're confused, you can always ask us. Um, I actually ended up getting quite good at the terminal because I had to use it a lot. Yes, rip laptop. Um, I don't know how that worked out for it, but it was fine, I guess, because I still use the same laptop. Um, so someone asked, um, what was the command for the guide slash help thingy? Um, it's man, so you can man any command. Um, it stands for manual. It is the manual. Um, right before this workshop, I read through the entire manual of a command I'm teaching because I panicked and it was stressful. It's very helpful. It will tell you all of the options. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it, it's just always there. It's You can always try and figure out what flags you need for whatever you want to do or something. Um, I think we've paused enough to make sure that everyone felt caught up. So a quick reminder that we've done LS tech A which lets you see all of the files in the directory. I'm going to clear my screen because that's a lot to look at. Um, ignore this slash. That was a mistype. Um, and then we've also done ls tac l, which allows you to show more, learn more information um, about the file. So what do you mean by th three to the left of root? So when we run PWD, this is our path. Um, it's PWD stands for print working directory. So print the folder that we're currently working in. Um, it shows home slash magpie. So we remember that um, this slash is considered the root, the biggest folder that contains all of the other folders that we have in our system. Um, so that is called root. And then we're in another folder, which is called home. Um, and then we're in another folder called magpie. 
So after that first slash, that first slash means the root folder, but then all the others just separate the names of folders. Uh, and then the 311 next to the root, uh, I believe that represents the number of, they call it hard links to that specific file. So the number of links in the Linux file system to it. So for instance, example file.txt is referenced exactly once in this directory. So it has the one beside it. Uh, then directory, I believe, would have three links. So the one here, the one to go back, and then be another one. The one inside of it? The one inside of it. Yeah, that would make sense. <laughs> yes. Uh, so those are just a number of hard links next to it. Yeah. That's something I didn't know. Josh just taught me that. <laughs> I just researched that today. So <laughs> you learn something new every day. Okay. Um, uh, and then there is one more command we want to show you to do uh, with ls. And that's just if you don't feel like arguably typing up those extra four characters, you can type in ls dash al and you'll get all that information at once. So you'll get both the hidden directory slash files and the uh, information about the files. So you can combine in most commands as many flags as you want. These are called flags when you do the al. Um, so this could be like a big long string of just a bunch of flags and you would just get more and more information that you wanted if you wanted to know a ton. Okay, so we've learned about how to see what's in our current folder, but we don't know how to do anything with that. So we have two text files. So a text file just has normal ASCII characters. So like English words, words that you can read and you're used to, or maybe emojis, things like that, that exist on something called an ASCII chart. I will show an ASCII chart. Oh. Um, these are ASCII charts, they have numbers, but basically if you think about all of the different letters that you can type on your keyboard and all the different characters you can type on your keyboard, whenever you see something that's a text file, it typically, and remember typically, not always, um, will have words in them. But we can't actually open any of these files because we can't double click them like we can in our file finder. That won't do anything. The terminal doesn't know what the mouse is. Um, so there's a command called cat, um, and we are going to man cat, as Emily's favorite word, to um, find out what cat does. Um, so um, according to the man page, cat concatenates and prints files. So concatenate basically means put together um, right next to each other. So if I were to concatenate the words hello and world, it would become hello world all smushed together with no space inside of it. So concatenate is basically just put the two things together. When we concatenate files on our machines, we are putting them together with nothing, with empty space. So it just ends up um, putting the file, like printing the file for us. So we have two text files. So there's this one called example file dot text. So how would I read it? How would I use cat to read it? You actually just write cat and example file dot text and then enter. And you'll see it will write out all of the, all of what's in this file for us. So it says this is a file. It's not a particularly cool file, but a file nonetheless. Bye. Um, with a bunch of white space in it. Um, I'm now going to give you guys a chance to explore. Um, a reminder that there are flags in our workshops and we've hidden them all around and you can submit them to Orchid by DMing her. So I'm going to give two to three minutes to just explore around and see what you can find. Um, see if you can try other commands that you know. What's inside this machine? Um, Josh, can you deal? Or yes, yeah. 
that flag. Um, and let us know if the flag works. Flag is working for me, it appears. Okay, um, Nicholas, you might have to DM an exec and just talk to them about how to submit flags to ORCID. Um, uh, just yeah. let us know. It's always good to just copy and paste right from the thing, so in case anything like a 1 or an L can, gets confusing. Um, Muhammad... If you're stuck at the man cat, just press the letter Q and it should exit. It still shows up all on your screen. So if you don't want all of these words on your screen, um, write the word clear on your terminal and press enter and that will delete everything. Yep. And yeah, glad to hear the uh, flag was just misspelled. That happens a lot with all of us. Um, I'm going to give you guys till 7.10 to just explore. In the meantime, Green Carrot has checked the leaderboard. Is the competition already on? It is. You can check it as many times as you want. <laughs> it's important to know your standing. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it gets very intense by the end of the year, so you want to make sure you get all the flags you can now. <laughs> um, Muhammad, are you still stuck even after you press Q and then um, in your screen? Um, so you might just have to close your terminal entirely um, and then run the SSH command. It tells me to log in a file. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, Alternatively, control C tends to get you out of a stuck command if uh, something's frozen on your thing. If it absolutely does not work, what I would do is I would go see Jeremy in the streaming chat and he can help you get out of the situation. Yes. Awesome. Uh it's been a couple of minutes now, so had some time to look around in that little in that folder there. Uh, but we've been stuck here for a little while, so maybe it's time for us to do some ex doing some exploring. Uh, so we told you about the file system before; you've been stuck here. Uh, but if we want to change directories, we can use a command called cd, and then followed by wherever whatever directory or folder we'd like to move to. So in this case, we have uh, one option visible to us. Uh, directory. So if we do cd and then type in directory, it'll take us into a new space. 
Uh, so here, first thing you may want to do is just type ls, see what's in there. And another directory. That's not the same folder, uh, just name the same, just to confuse you. And if we keep moving through here, if we do cd directory as well, something that's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of heartache. Uh, if you want to just cd to say there's only one directory in there, then if you type in that cd command, and then space, and then tab, it should just autocomplete for you. And you can go through, and you don't have to type everything out. So cd, another, and you keep going through there. But if we want to, say, return to a previous directory, then we can do cd, I'll wait for, yeah, cd dot dot. And that just means that you're changing to the previous directory you were just in. And then, awesome. Thanks, Alex, for navigating for me. Uh, as well, there is one other thing you can do. It doesn't actually do anything, but just cool to see. So if you do, if you type in cd and then dot, it doesn't change your directory. It just means that uh, you're changing directory to exactly the folder you are currently in, because dot just represents uh, your current folder. And so if we, and there, as you may have noticed that there's more directories we didn't explore, more secret folders we didn't see. So if you want to take some time and look in there, we'll give you about five to 10 minutes just to work around, explore around the uh, file system yourself and see what there is to offer. Keep in mind, there are still flags spread throughout. And if you like to use this time to find those, you can get yourself some nice internet points. Um, let us know when you get flags. We like yeah. to know. It helps us figure out when people are lost, when they're stuck. Um, uh, you can view hidden folders with LS Tech A. Mm -hmm. That shows all. Yes. And alternatively, LS Tech AL, if you want to see all the information about the file, too. Cool. Um, uh, and uh, share when you get the flag, but please don't share the actual flag in the chat. Yes. So when you find a flag, um, there is one in flag.txt. So remember that you can um, sh print the contents of a text file by using the command cat. Um, then you can submit the flag by DMing ORCID. So ORCID is in our Discord under hashtag ORCID. You'll see a bot. Um, she has an ORCID in front of her. If you DM her, you can send her a flag and then you will show up on the leaderboard. Um, that is how people are getting flags. So I think we'll give until, let's see, 7.23, Alex. All right. Cool. Um, we might give a little less than that. We're just going to see. Yeah. We're going to play it by ear and figure out what you guys need. Yes. Uh, so just let us know when you find flags, and we can see how things are going for you as well if you need any help.
I just wanted to pop in to say yes. In all of our workshops, the prefix to our flag is UC SEC. So if that helps you find more flags, um, it, it, that's just to let you know. It also helps you identify if something's actually flagged and not just random text. It will always have UC SEC and then an open bracket and a closed bracket at the end with some kind of text in between. To go back in directories, uh, just type in cd space dot dot, and it'll take you to the previous directory you're in. And you can also chain those with uh, slashes as well. So if you don't feel like typing cd dot dot several times, uh, you cd dot dot slash dot dot, and keep it going. So, like, Alex is showing on screen there. No problem. And remember to post it in the chat here if you get in, if you're finding any flags. Just a heads up that we are giving you the opportunity to find flags because um, <laughs> because it's fun to find the flags yourself, but we are going to walk through and continue teaching. We have still more to teach um, and we will show everyone how to find the flags. Uh, we believe you should get rewarded for going to this workshop, for going to workshops themselves um, and actually get on the board. A lot of what the leaderboard is, is proving that you participated in a ton of workshops. As we get farther into the year, there will be challenges where we don't just show you how to get the flag and it will be up to you guys. Um, but we are going to, in this workshop, show you the majority of flags. There will be a couple that we don't show hidden in this machine. How many flags are there? Let me count. <laughs> Uh, 
By my count, there are nine total flags. Eight. There's a... Can I... oh, did I duplicate? There's a duplicate, yeah. Okay, there's eight yep. total flags. Awesome. Uh, with that, I think we can return to here, and let's start going through the directories and seeing what we can find all together. So, uh, first... Yeah, we're back here in the starting directory where we or were originally. And if we go into, let's say, picks of mice. So if we go to change directory into picks of mice. Pick, and you can tab to complete that. And let's see what we have in here. Just something called mice.txt. Uh, open that up. Oh, we have a bot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have two bots. Three? Anyways. <laughs> yeah, Quinn and the execs take care of that bot. <laughs> um, anyways. <laughs> uh, so this just says, ever heard of the band Mouse Rat? They played at the Pawnee Unity concert. And no flag here, though. So that was kind of a waste. But if we go back, doing cd dot dot, we had one more uh, super secret directory. And that's super secret picture. So if we go into there, and we see what's inside. 100% uh, not a flag, no cap. I think we should just trust it, but I guess Alex disagrees. And never heard curiosity killed the cat. And what you have there is a flag that satisfaction brought it back. So maybe you could submit that to Orchid and see what you can get from there. And so now we can return here. And we kind of went through the directory last time, but if we want to fully explore it, Oh, and also, yeah, we'll we never show showed this too. flag. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, this is just a talking head song, but also it's a flag. Yeah. And now we can go through the other directories that we left you to your own devices with. So, if we go and follow that directory and we keep on going. Do just. They made so many of them. Oh, so many. And a reminder, if you want to go quicker at this, you can do CD tab. And stop and finally, maybe. So if we look inside of finally, we will see something that says don't look in here and another thing that says pictures. Uh, Alex, should we honor its request to not look in there? <laughs> Never. OK, cool, then open it up. Awesome. Yep, knew they were hiding something. So that's another flag you have there. If you found that to yourself in the time we gave you, awesome job. If not, we'll see some even more uh, going through. So we did have another directory there, and it didn't look like there were any hidden files. So let's just go into pictures and see what we can find. I'm trying to clear my screen so it's easier for you guys to look. Do oh awesome and got some Muhammad on finding a flag there. Perfect. So what we have here is we have a few different files, uh, and if we look at let's see, if we look at zero cats, it says that it is size of zero. You may wonder how that is. It's a JPEG file, which if you're familiar with, it means that it's a it should mean that's a picture. But the thing with uh, Linux is that file extensions don't necessarily mean what they say they may just be fake things that we put there to trick you to so be that... clear that is true about all operating systems file extensions lie <laughs> yeah like trying to use dot text dot text and it just ruins me but so if we look at that we can actually cat zero cats.jpg and see whatever's inside those whole zero bytes absolutely nothing awesome uh and then if we look, if we want to look at some cats.jpg, uh, we can see that the size of it is 116. It might seem a little weird for a JPEG file again, but maybe that's another trick played on us. So if you look through some cats. Oh, yeah. Looks like it's another flag. And it, says that you didn't know uh, that you could open picture files like this, which you probably can't, but we're faking it. 
Now, let's see. So mm -hmm. you might wonder um, how you actually decide what, fi what file extensions are lying and which ones are telling the truth. Um, there is a command in Linux that will tell you exactly that. Yeah. It's called file. <laughs> um, file tells you information about what it thinks the file actually is because file extensions mean nothing. You can make any file and add any file extension on the end and it will probably still open like normal. There's a possibility it corrupts it, but in my experience, it's never done it. <laughs> um, so you can just add them willy-nilly. You could say anything's a text file, anything's a PNG. It doesn't matter. Um, so you can mm -hmm. use this command called file and actually run it against some of our files. So zero cats with zero bytes, which is weird because how can a file exist but also have nothing inside of it? And you see, it actually recognizes that. It just says it's empty. It's not a file type because there's nothing in it. So it can't decide what type it is. Yes. And then for this guy here, I didn't know it was a text file exactly, but I could see that by the small number of bytes, it was a bit weird for a JPEG. Those are usually larger, but then if we cat it, it will show the text and that's how you kind of know it's a text file beyond actually typing in file some cats, which tells you it straight out. Yeah. We see that it says it's ASCII text, which as I said before, is just normal typable characters that you know how to um, like that you see on your keyboard, meaning it would probably had some kind of English or something we could understand inside of it. Yep. So maybe they all lie. Let's just assume that. <laughs> um, maybe we can also cat many cats. Windows is very upset that I did that. Um, <laughs> you did that as well. Yeah. Um, so there's a ton of things that aren't really English inside of that. Um, that might indicate that it actually maybe is telling the truth, or it is a different kind of file than just normal ASCII. So let's file many cats. So. I guess many cats wasn't lying. It does say that it was JPEG, which means it's a picture. But normally when I would open a picture in a Windows machine, I would double click it. So what use does this have for us here um, in something where we can't click and we're just able to see text and the text looks like that? Um, so now I'm gonna teach you a command called strings. When we did um, cat, JPEG, many cats JPEG, there was some words inside of it um, and stuff that maybe looks like it could be English. So if you ever want to have a file look for all of the words that it thinks is English inside of it or actual text, you can use the command called strings. So what strings does is it looks for the minimum of four characters in a row that it thinks might actually be a word. So some of these are very clearly not words. They just happen to be um, bytes in the JPEG that are becoming ASCII, just the way it's rendering it when it's trying to look for strings. So a lot of these are nothing. They're just garbled nothing. But at the end of this, you will see that there's a bunch of English in it. Um, we can actually pare this down farther. Okay, I can show the strings command again. The strings command is just strings and then the file that you want to find all the strings in. It's really, um, it can be intuitive. And it will show you all the strings in it. But if we wanted to pare this down even further and we wanted to search for a specific pattern. As we said before, all of our flags start with UCSEC. So if we strings, many strings, many cats, and then we send it through something called a pipe. This is usually, if you have a stand, if you have a keyboard that looks like mine, I guess, um, above your enter key, um, there's a little up and down um, line that when you're typing it in the terminal is called a pipe. It basically sends 
whatever this is printing out onto the terminal into another command. So I want to send it into a command called grep. What grep does essentially is pattern matching. So I want to find something that contains the word ucsec in all of the strings that this JPEG originally printed out. If I run that, um, I will, if I run that and type strings correctly. <laughs> yeah, the plural there. It will show me all of the times it can find that ucsec. I believe it finds it twice. Um, I don't know where the other one is found here. Normally, if you're on your normal at home terminal or you're on a Kali VM or anything other than what me and Josh have set up here, it also highlights it. Sadly, because of just how we've set up this workshop, it um, can't highlight, it can't really resolve colors that well, so it's not actually highlighting it. Um, someone said, if you man strings, you can learn a ton about strings. It finds all the printable strings and files. We can also, I tried to, um, we can also man grep. I read this all today. We talked about this. This is the command that I read the whole man page before this workshop because I couldn't figure out how to get it to um, highlight colors like it does on my personal machine. And I've found a lot out about that. Um, it's basically an issue with how the workshop is set up. But you can see there's a ton of flags that we can add to um, grep in order to make it more specific about the pattern that we're looking for um, or anything. If you know anything about regex, regex is a funky math way of defining patterns. They look really weird. You will maybe learn them in a course that I believe is 351 now. When I took it, it was called 313, CPSC 313. It is short for regular expression. Um, it basically just defines a pattern and says, look for everything that looks like this. Um, so you can do that with grep, but you can also just look for basic words. I keep trying to exit it like Vim. So again, if we want to find all the strings that contain UCSEC, the front to our flag in this many cats JPEG, we can go strings, many cats, a pipe. Oops. This sends all of the output of this strings, many cats into this grep command. And it looks for all of the times that UCSEC appears and it will show us a couple. And then you get a flag. Um, something interesting about how this challenge is set up is that means that this is a real JPEG. I can open it on my Windows computer if I want, and it is a picture of cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've actually managed to shove text inside of that picture because not all of the space and those funky... Um, I don't need the strings, I need to cut it. Not all of these crazy, weird text things are important to making the image show up. A lot of them are, and you can totally break an image by getting rid of them, and it just won't render, and the computer will yell at you and say, I can't open this file, it's been corrupted. But some of them, you can actually just write over top of them, and it will still render totally fine, and the picture will show up on your computer like any normal picture. So I've, I've actually inserted a bunch of text over top of those old bytes, and it just happened to be that those weren't that important for it to render. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so it worked fine. Um, and that is a little bit about what happened in that challenge. So that was a lot. Pipes are very scary and we're to go more into them. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? And I'm going to wait a bit because there's a nice delay. Uh, so for sending flags to Orchid, uh, you just have to DM the bot Orchid and send the flag right there. 
And if you want to check how many points you have, you can go to the Orchid channel on our Discord and type in, I'll put the command here, O leaderboard, and you can see where you stand. But to submit the flags, uh, please just DM Orchid. Uh, and here is the command. So you'll see here, if I can get that on my screen, um, I spoke to Orchid wrong and I didn't spell her name correctly, but in previous years, um, if you just send a flag to Orchid, these are no longer valid flags, so don't worry, you can't send them, they don't mean anything. Um, she will either tell you you found a flag and how much it's worth, or if you send something that's not a flag. She just says nothing back, and that is your indication that that's not a flag. Um, so that's how you know you've sent a flag, and that's how you submit them. Yep. So, all right, looks like don't have any questions regarding uh, that chunk there. Uh, but so move on to go over the executables. Yes. Yes, awesome. Um, so we're going to go one further. Mm hmm into secret picture drop jpeg because again i think we probably could have filed that again it's lying to you because it's lying to you yeah. never telling the truth about the extensions file extensions mean nothing don't really put that much weight on them because it doesn't really tell you much about the file um this is a directory uh so it's a folder so we can actually cd into it change the directory into it And ls again. So in this folder, there are there is something called an executable, which a bunch of you found and weren't actually sure what to do with, which I'm sorry to say I did not add a flag to this. Um, I probably should have, but I just didn't. So there's not a lot, but I am going to explain what an executable is and how we run them. So earlier, Josh explained file permissions. They're over here in this... Um, garbled rwx um, part of the information of the file and as he said before this is go away linkedin um <laughs> this is the owner this is yes. this is the owner this is the group which means something kind of complicated and this is just everyone so it looks like everyone has the x permission which stands for executable so the read permission is when we can like cat input dot text we're able to read that file um if we were able to write to that file we don't actually have write permission to that file then we would be able to overwrite it which might be an issue Um, and finally, the X permission, which means we can execute it. So when you think about um, a file that you get um, or a, a program that you get, like if you download Adobe Photoshop or um, <laughs> any kind of program that you might run a game, you get something called an executable. In a Windy, it's a, a Windows, it's a .exe file. Um, and that basically means it's runnable. It's some kind of code that's been programmed. So if we want to run executables on a Linux machine, if it already has this X permission, um, then we are just, then we just need to put a dot, a slash, and then executable in front of it. And I need to spell it right. Tab is I don't know what's going on. Let's see. Is it because we put really crazy permissions on that one? Yes. On the folder. Might have to do with that. But it's saying it can't find the file. Weird. 
Um, I'm going to quickly try and fix this live, which is very scary. Get to see the creation in action. <laughs> More pressure. There we go. So. Uh, try recompiling it. Oh. I can't. Ah, uh, the permissions. So we've put some super hardcore permissions on these so people can't mess with it, which is maybe um, destroying last... our ability to run. Yeah, last year we had uh, it with everyone has free reign to edit whatever files they like and delete whatever things they like. And it kind of got rid of a few of the challenges we had. Yes, GCC has been not installed on this thing. Mm. Yep. Do. Um, while this happens, Josh, I'm going to let you go with text editors and I will be out. Awesome. I will share mine then. All right. So let me see if I can share my screen on here. Do. There we go. All right. So. On here, we're going to show off some other commands uh, while we wait for the executable to work, if possible. So next thing that we want to show you is something called echo. It's basically the simple thing that just does what it just prints out whatever you tell it to print out. It just repeats it back to you. So if I can do this, so it's more obvious. Yeah, so you see if you echo thing, it just prints out thing back to you. But it, and then if you want to, Echo some other things like, oh, how are you? Just as that. But with Echo, you can do some cooler things than just having it display to the console. You can also echo into a file if we have made those permissions OK. So let's see if we can do, we can put out hello into something called imp.txt. And nope, the file permissions are wrong. But usually you can do that. And let's see, so you can echo into different things. Oh, right. So this here is essentially, uh, it means overwrite. So if you were to say echo hello into a pre-existing file, like we have input.txt, then you would be overwriting whatever's in that file. It could contain your entire essay for a midterm. And this would just overwrite the entire thing, which makes it a very dangerous command that you want to be careful of. Uh, something a bit less dangerous is to use the double greater than symbol. So if you use the double, then rather than overwrite, it means that it will, I believe it's concatenate. Yeah, so that means that it will concatenate onto the uh, existing file. So if you want to just add hello, let's say, to your essay, then it'll just add hello to the end of it rather than rewrite the whole thing. But So we have the concatenation there. And, but if we want to actually edit files and not have to say, type out your entire program on the terminal here, like, I don't know if we want to say print hello world, something like that. And we don't want to have to print it all on the command line. There's also text editors that you can access from the terminal, uh, not like things like v v VS code. So first I'll show you is something called Vim. And if you haven't heard of Vim, uh, haven't ever opened it, then you may not be familiar with the number one complaint with Vim, at least my number one complaint with it, is it can be really hard to edit and it can be really hard to exit out of it if you aren't sure how to work it. So when you first open Vim, this is the screen that's usually displayed to you. And actually, sorry, the way that you 
open a vim thing, a vim uh, file, is you type vim, you type the file name if you're creating one, then whatever name you want. If it's one that exists, let's say input.txt, then you can do that. And you can't overwrite me, which we can't. But let's say we want to open a new file called vim and then do it vim hello.txt. So first thing you're going to do when you enter vim is press the i button. This will save you uh, lots of frustration with trying to figure out how to edit this, because if you have it like this, it'll just scream at you until now you press the i button by accident. When you press that, you're allowed to edit it, say whatever you want. Hello. And then to get out of this mode, you press the escape button. So insert, so I to insert to add text, escape to exit out of that. As well, if you want to actually be able to exit Vim, which is a main complaint with a lot of people, you have to type in colon Q. But you'll see that we have this thing, uh, no write since last change, add exclamation point override. Uh, so if you do want to, if you want to do that, then you have to write and quit. And nice tutorial for Vim here. Thank you. So if you want to get proficient with Vim, looks like this might be a good link for you. Uh, but if you want to be able to write the file and quit, so this will create it, uh, then you do colon WQ. And it says can't open file for writing because we don't have the permissions on this box. So what you want to do then is you'll want to believe it's exclamation point Q means that you will quit without saving. But then it'll take you to this page here. And this got me confused when I first started using Vim. Because if you press enter, it'll just take you back to this page right here. And something I learned today was to get out of this, you need to do exclamation point Q A. And that just aborts everything, lets you go free, or at least it should work for me before. Do or it just breaks on you. Which is something Vim loves to do. But if we do this. Hmm. It's always fun. Ah, okay. Thank you, Greg. And this is why I dislike Vim. All right, so next up, we have something called Nano. And that's another text editor for the uh, command line. Usually comes packaged in with the uh, distribution of Linux. So with Nano, you just type in Nano and then whatever the file name is, like that. And this one's... Uh, more lightweight, a lot more user friendly than Vim from what I've seen. And you can just type in right from the get go. Go in. Cool. And to exit this one, uh, they have little helpers right at the bottom of the screen, like exit. So you just do Control X. And if you want to save it, you press yes and the file name. Again, no permission. So we just want to exit and not save anything. Perfect. So that is, those are the two main hex. Those are two main text editors that come with this. There's also something called Emacs, which you may have heard of. Uh, there's a great war between Vim and Emacs, depending who prefers what. Uh, despite Vim's flaws, I still do prefer Vim, and we are not showing off Emacs today. Can you go back? Yeah, of course I can go back and stuck in Nano. Uh, so Nano here. To exit out of this, uh, you're gonna type, you're gonna do Control X. And I didn't write anything, so it immediately exits for me. But if I had written things, and then I do Control X, it'll ask me to save. Uh, if you because we can't write anything, you're gonna type N for no, and it should let you out. Uh, so let me know if that one worked out for you. Perfect. And then beyond that, there is another way of creating. Oh, awesome! No problem. And beyond that, there is another way of creating files in here. And if you want to just create, for instance, how I made the empty file from earlier, the zero cats, you can use the command called touch. Vim and VI, I believe VI. So VI is very similar to Vim. I believe it's more lightweight. It usually comes with more distributions of Linux. Uh, for instance, I had to install Vim uh, manually on this box, but it just came with VI already. Uh, it works the exact same as Vim with the escape Q 
CR. I believe so. Yeah, so it works the exact same as Vim with the escape key and the insert key. Uh, but they are essentially the same there. And they also have the same issue of being annoying to exit. Oh, cool. And Greg has got that one there. Yeah, so VI might just be an alias for Vim now, though they do have a different appearance on there, just slightly. There we go. And then on to how to create a file, let's say that's zero bytes. If you just want to create a file for the sake of it, uh, there's a command called touch. So touch will it make whatever file you want in the current directory. So let's say we're going to, I don't know if I've created a new one, but I probably haven't. So again, permission denied, but this would create a file, for instance, like input.txt. It would just show up there and it would be uh, zero bytes because you have not included anything inside the file. So it'd be a lot like zero cats.jpg here. And then beyond that, there is one more command I'm going to show you for the night before we uh, call it an evening. This is one of the most, more dangerous commands in Linux, and I recommend giving it a read, giving the man page of this a read before using any of the options. Uh, you may see in our Discord some people have uh, a certain command with rm. Uh, <laughs> And then, so it'll, it'll, they have a string command with rm that could destroy your entire file system and just leave it blank. So if you see a random command with rm involved, don't just type it willy-nilly into the terminal. It can be quite dangerous. And then, as you just said, if you Google vi or vim uh, into Google, it, it'll show you uh, if you meant emacs and the same way around, because uh, even Google knows the great war that has gone on for centuries. Uh, so here, and again, Q to just exit the man pages. But RM essentially just removes a file. So RM will remove, again, if we have actual permissions to, we could remove zero cats. They ask you to. We're, just in case it actually lets me, we're not going to. Wait, can I? Yep, OK. So for that, if we want to say remove a file, then we just type in rm plus that file name and it'll get rid of it forever. Uh, Linux in its basic form, at least for this distribution, doesn't come with, if you work with Mac or Windows, uh, it doesn't come with a trash bin. So if you remove this file, it's more than likely gone forever. At least as far as I know, it happened with an assignment a year ago and just removed the file by accident and it was gone. So definitely be careful with this rm command. And that was also the reason why we restricted the permissions for this workshop. We may have to revisit that later on, but that was because a lot of the files were just getting removed and they were necessary things like uh, flags were in there. So it was costing people points. But yeah, so were there any questions about those few commands I went over or any of the text editors? Do. Yeah, give it a bit because of the delay. As well as Greg said, uh, VI opens Vim. Vim was an improved version of VI. So I guess I know which side of the war he may fall on. Perfect. So if we go through there, slash executable. Hmm. So I can actually run executables now, which means I can probably show you. Winner! <laughs> it worked? <laughs> I fixed it. Awesome. All right, shall I give screen back to you? Um, yeah. Not yet. Um, give me three seconds. OK. Uh, so we got things working. Let's see if I can create files again, because that'd be quite nice. Nope. Of course not. So we got the executables working at least. And what you can see here is that it repeats whatever you type into it, similar to how we did with Echo. So yeah, except this one is on new lines for it. 
And it doesn't look like you can still create any files, though. All right. <laughs> Welcome um, back. Hello, everyone. I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, we're using a special Linux called Alpine, which for everyone who knows about Linux, um, typical user-friendly quote-unquote Linuxes would be considered Ubuntu, um, Debian-based distributions, just because there are developers out there that when there's a bug, um, they fix it and stuff. And something about Alpine is that it has nothing pre-installed on it. So I had to reinstall everything um, myself. That being said, I believe I fixed the problem. Um, and we can now run. I'm going to share my screen, Josh. Oh, yes, I will. There you go. Executables, and we can now actually edit input.txt. <laughs> and input.txt is green because I couldn't deal with permissions at the time. Um, so how do we run an executable? So as I said, an executable is like a program that you get. Um, whether it be like Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, I can only think of Adobe products right now for some reason. I guess Google Chrome would also be an executable. So someone has programmed something and they want you to actually be able to run it and interact with it. Um, that is what an executable is called. When you get them in Windows, they're usually the extension .exe and then you just double click them and they run. Um, we can't double click here. Again, major problem, forever problem. So what do we do? We should be able to go dot slash and then the name. And that lets us run it. <laughs> um, so this is a really simple program that I made. Um, actually, I mostly stole from Jeremy from last year's <laughs> because I'm not that good at C. It's written in C um, and it just says, what should I repeat? And then it kind of hangs. It's not actually hanging, it's waiting for input. So if you type on your terminal, um, anything, and then press enter, it will um, repeat that. So if we run it again, and then type, hello, everyone, I fixed it. <laughs> it will repeat that out. <laughs> Um, if we want to see what that file is actually doing, we'll see that there's something called executable.c. I kept the names the same just so it would be clear that they were the same file. So C is a programming language. It's super low level. You learn it as you get into later years of computer science, um, and it can be helpful for infosec. As Josh taught you, we can vim things. Yep. And we can see the code. Um, C is a little complicated if all you've programmed in is Python, but essentially what it does is it makes a string that's worth 100 characters. It prints, what should I repeat? We saw that on screen. It then uses uh, gets to get whatever we ask it to repeat, and then it prints that back out and it returns and the function is over. Um, I wonder why it would bork the session. Interesting. Um, something fun that you guys can do um, is maybe man the command gets. Um, that is a command we talk about in some of our binary exploitations. That um, workshops that we do, it will come up in the beginners, but something about that is if we run that executable again, so remember dot slash executable, and then we just scream at it. This has become a joke in our club. Um, if you ever get something that asks for input, just give it as much input as humanly possible um, and see what happens because some things, sometimes funky things happen. Um, we get a seg fault which if you've ever taken 355, you're very familiar with, and it makes you upset. <laughs> um, and it says core dumped. This is basically, we're overflowing the amount of memory it's asking for, which is complex programming concepts. It's okay if you don't understand, I just thought I'd show you. Um, but yes, this program takes input um, and then just repeats it back. That's all it does. Um, so what can we do with that? Um, I showed you earlier, input.txt has 
what should I repeat? Someone has messed with that, I believe. <laughs> or I have messed with it, one or the others. Um, that's what's inside of it. If I want to send that as the input that this program repeats, I can actually go cat input dot text as we're familiar with that pipe thing again and then just run the executable oh i spelled that right it then actually re just sends in what should i repeat it never actually prints it on the terminal like it was before it just sends it in and then repeats it so we can overwrite this input dot text with anything that we want Someone has added hello with Josh's fun vin commands. I'm going to add ABC. Um, and we're probably going to break this with a swap file because we can't all actually edit the same. The other great thing about vim is uh, editing multiple versions of the same file at once. It'll create a dot swap file, which contains a different version of it. And, and it is upset. Yes. <laughs> So if I run that same command again with whatever is now in that, oh, it's the same. Okay, let's do something fun then. I don't know what Jeremy just said. <laughs> Apparently the but... moon is red. Oh, that is in real life. I, I'm in a basement. <laughs> Anyways, fun facts apparently. So if I want to overwrite this file and write something else in it without having to open Vim, I actually can. So I don't know if we've gone over echo because I temporarily left, but echo just repeats whatever you tell it. So when you say echo hi, it will repeat hi. You can do this with anything, any string. Um, I've it's actually never tried fun. this. Um, echo you. one. Sorry. Oh, it won't allow you to edit the files, at least from what I was trying. I can't overwrite it. Let's find out. Echo ABC and then send it with this arrow to input.text. I was like, it, I'm... input not text is now ABC. So that single arrow is another type of pipe type command and it is sending whatever would get echoed out so if we just echoed abc it would it would write abc but we're actually sending that into input.txt and it completely overwrites whatever was originally in it if we then wanted instead of overwriting something to append what we were putting into input.txt we can do a double arrow and then it will do that fancy thing called concatenate. So if there was already something inside of input.txt, like ABC, it would then write ABC twice. And you'll see that someone actually appended DEF. So those are easy ways to just add stuff to text. So now if we run input.txt against the executable again, it will then repeat ABC instead of um, what should I repeat? Just to prove that it's actually working. Um, then I want to quickly go over, I know we're a little over time. I just want to quickly go over two more things. So there's something um, called sudo. If no one knows what sudo is, it's a really funky name. It stands for super user do. It looks like this. It's written like this. Um, and sudo allows you to for that command, assume administrator privileges or root privileges to run anything you want. So I believe, let's look at our permissions. Um, executable or executable.c does not have write permissions for us. So we shouldn't be able to write to it. So if we do that fun echo command and we try and overwrite executable.c should yellow us. It says permission denied. We're not allowed to do that. If we know the sudo password, then we are. So if you wanted to then run that same command, but you wanted to be allowed to do it and you knew the, the, the 
administrator password, you can prepend it with sudo. Fun fact is, <laughs> because it's Alpine Linux, we don't actually have sudo installed. And it just doesn't know what it is, and it said permission denied. Yeah. Oh. Pseudo cat. Oh, actually, we do. I don't know why that command. So if I try to pseudo cat, if I didn't have permission to read something, I might want to pseudo cat it. Um, it asks for the pseudo or password. If we type in the wrong password, it says three password in three incorrect password attempts, and it will yell at you. If you're not allowed to pseudo something, you don't have the permissions. It sends this very angry message that says this will be reported. Um, no one knows who it's reported to. Santa, I guess. Um, that's an XKCD comic if you've seen it. Um, <laughs> the other command I want to talk about is sue. So sue is, is different than sudo. It's basically allowing you to assume a user. So if I wanted to sue root, which I doubt I can, because root doesn't exist, I would then become the root user. It would open a whole new terminal, and I would be able to have any of the permissions that that user had. Uh, so those are two important commands. We just wanted to show you them before we wrapped up. Um, does anyone have any questions? And give it a bit for the delay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So. so if there was another user on this machine, um, so at the school computer, you can log into anyone um, in the front page. <laughs> um, you just give the username and your password and there's multiple different users on that machine. Or in your, when you, we used to have family computers, um, you might've had your mom, your dad, and your brother say on the computer as different users. If they had access to different files with these permissions than you had, um, and you wanted to go look at that file, you could say sue dad. And if dad was a user on the machine, you would then open a new terminal, essentially. It would open a new terminal as dad the user, as long as you had his password. You need to have his password to do this because they are going to check. Um, sudo is assuming the administrator privileges for just that command. So the, the difference again is either you are assuming it just for the command or you could be assuming it for the entire session. All right. Um, so thank you so much for staying this long, especially through our little um, moment of crisis. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um next week let us um i believe if we go into infosec actually i'm sharing my screen on this side mm -hmm. we go to our website we should be able to see in our calendar what is next week. So next week we have Intro to Web by Greg. Um, this is when we are going to start splitting up into beginners and advanced workshops. Our beginner workshop next week is Intro to Web Exploitation that will be streamed again on YouTube and Twitch. And then our advanced session is breaking into to a box with eJazz. That will be on the Discord. Um, so if you have any questions about which ones you should go to, uh, they are all recorded so you can see them all in the end, but we ask that you, um, actively try and go to and participate in one. Um, it's at 6 p.m. next week on Mondays. Uh, if you have any questions, you can hop in our Discord and make sure that you get Cali set up. Uh, do you have any closing remarks, Josh? Uh, not much for me. Just uh, thank you all again for attending this workshop and for anyone to harken back to the beginning of it. If anyone's interested in being a junior exec for this year, info session is next Wednesday at 6 p.m. also on our Discord. Uh, and hope to see some of you there. Uh, we'll have cameras on if you if you wish, so I can actually see faces. If you have any inkling in like maybe being interested in joining the executive of our team, definitely come. Just because you go to the info session doesn't mean you're going to apply. It'll just mm. give you a chance to actually ask questions from us. I know you've barely been in this club, so you don't actually know if you want to be a part of it yet. Um, 
thank you so much for sticking around. I know we're over time by about 15 minutes, but I just wanted to thank you so much for joining. All right. Awesome. Bye. Have a good night.